Hello, everybody. Yeah. I'll give you a little bit of background of who I am at the Bridges. Is we're an employee engagement and culture specialist. But what we do is we look at brands. So we understand what is the DNA that sits in an organization, such as its values, its vision, its mission, and then translates that into human behavior. Since we all work for organizations, it's important to utilize the brand status because that is where the promise should sit, I believe, in all businesses. It extends outwardly to our customers, and that's why they buy us. And it should extend outwardly to our future employees, because that's why they buy us. And it should definitely stand, st extend in the hand of kindness to our existing employees, because that's why they stay with us. So when we really begin to think about what is a brand, uh, it's interesting. I, I like to kind of kick off with the Bridge logo. Now, we did a rebrand about uh, maybe about two or three years ago. And I used to have a little bridge man in there. It was a little stick man that looked like a bridge. Then I helped design when I set up the company 15 years ago. And it was really hard for me to let go of him. In fact, I still have little secret places where I hide my bridge man. Uh, and if you look deeply into our website, it's like finding Elmo. He is still in there somewhere. <clears throat> but what, what does that logo say to you? Now, some people go, oh, it's a little bit confusing. It's colorful. It's nice. But there's a story that sits in this logo. Because it needs to sit in the story of the organization, as does all of your organizations have a story. So what the yellow is, the yellow is always a representation of our company culture. We used a bright color, uh, and it's done in a half circle. Because what we believe is we work in partnership with our clients, so they complete the other half. But that is why it's designed with that yellow as well, because we wanted our, it to represent our people, which is kind of fun, energetic, vibrant. Now, the two blue lines that extend from the logo is our strategy and the way we work in parallel with our clients. And, it's a, and they are seamlessly put together. And then the red is our arrow pointing up, which is our creativity. So it wasn't just a logo that we created. It's part of who we are as an organization and who we are as a business. And I believe that it's important for all of us to connect to our own brands and our organizations at that level. Because they're not just companies and they're not places to go to work. They're places that house us. And they're places that support us. And they're the reasons why customers buy us. What differentiates any business from any other business, especially when they're selling the same product? Now, now I, I really uh, find it interesting. I just flew back. I've been going back and forth to Delhi quite a bit recently because we have a client over there. And, and on almost back-to-back -back trips, I flew Virgin Airways and I flew BA. And I analyzed the service the whole way. And they were very different. Both professional, both great service, but a very different personality. Um, and the other thing about our logo is it breaks apart. It's not a static logo, so sometimes you might see one piece of it somewhere else and another piece somewhere else, which again represents our flexibility. Now, I'm not here to sell bridge, but what I am here is to get us to start thinking about what our companies represent, uh, right from a brand to a logo to then to our people. Yeah, I was recently, uh, uh, many years ago, and when I first started looking at values and, and what it means to the organization, I was working with a financial company, and I was meeting with the head of HR, the head of training, the head of the contact center, and all of these people. And they just spent about 20,000 pounds, no, Amer or not American dollars in UK pounds, etching them in a nice glass wall that ran down to their conference room. And I sat in the room with all these people, and I asked them that question, and none of them could tell me what they were. And I thought, wow, you spent 20,000 pounds, probably about, that's about 27,000 American dollars, on etching them. Why wouldn't you spend that on supporting your people? Because if they are just words on a wall, what's the point? They mean nothing when they're just words. So they should define who you are as an organization. So when I look at the bridge values, it starts to tell the story about how we treat each other, how we support our employees, how we work with customers, how we create bespoke solutions. So to me, I believe inspiring collaborative energy, not just, you know, not just working collaboratively, collaboratively I actually believe in inspiring th that energy with people, giving them the opportunity to challenge themselves, sharing knowledge openly. You know, whether it's a conference, a, a report, or something, I believe that everybody in an organization knows something that other people don't know. And if we just began sharing our knowledge with each other, that would lend itself at a different level of support. Uh, keeping it real and fun, 
Uh, I think I saw you guys all last night, so that's not going to be a challenge. Uh, that was pretty, that was a good fun night. But I think we've got to get back to what I call the human element. We're all human beings at the end of the day. And we all like to laugh. And we all like to have fun. I don't mean fun just for fun's sake, but we've got to lighten it up a little bit if we're going to talk about wellness. Pushing creative boundaries, to me, I think we should be always challenged to try new things. And that get, keeps employees excited by the mere possibility that they have an opportunity to be part of the part of the or be a part of the future of an organization. And then celebrating uniqueness. There are no two fingerprints the same or no two eye scans the same. So why do we start treating employees all the same? We have to have some commonality in how we work together, but we also are all unique in our own right. And especially when it comes to wellness. But it's important for us to start this dialogue because I believe that brands are alive. And the reason why they are alive is because you process them in the right part of your brain in the same place you process relationships. You love brands, hate brands, inspire to brands, never will ever go and see that brand again. Has anybody ever had a bad experience with a particular company and you got very righteous to say, I will never use you again <laughs> and told everybody? Yeah. Because brands give us emotion because we process them as relationships. And that's why when we look at wellness, we've got to look at the employee brand because they process the relationship they have with the organization in a very emotive way. Does it protect them? Does it make them feel safe? Does it give security? Is it supportive? And then we're gonna look at leadership on top of all of that because now it's the job of the leader not only to manage, not only to lead, but now also be wellness experts. Okay, so when I look at this, it's, the brand goes out with its values and its promises and we should know them, not just try to recite them. We should actually know what they are in a behavioral state. Because that customer, when I first set up uh, Bridge, was generally the external customer. Now it's our internal customers as well, because they are all the same. Anybody who buys you or buys into you is your customer. And I believe our employees need to buy into us in order to get that excellence in customer experience. And then I have what we call living brands. Living brands are our people. And that's when they really are representing what the brand promises but they're so interconnected to it and engaged with it that they feel supported by it. Now, <laughs> there's so much that goes into those three bubbles. The simplicity of what that drawing looks like is really all that is going on in an organization at all times. Being in push and pull with our external, internal customers from what our brand promises that it's going to deliver on to what the people have to then deliver on that promise. Should I ask the question again? Has at any point working in a contact center the brand overpromised something in either marketing or the way it presented itself and left you in the firing line to pick up the pieces? Yeah, it's not because it intentionally did it. You know, it's not like anybody in marketing said, "Yeah, let's screw with those contact center guys." Yeah. I remember once I was actually working with some leaders at MBNA at the time, big credit card company. Um, and I just happened to be on site in the contact center when it happened. And they'd sent out like a million mailers for 0% interest credit cards and never told anybody in the contact center they'd gone out. What do you think happened to call volume on that? Quick call this number and get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Imagine what the stress levels were right then and there to deliver. All right. Okay. So what are these values that we need to have? Now, uh, it doesn't matter. I am not asking you to set up new values in your organization. What I am looking at is how do we translate those into employee engagement and also into well-being? Uh, these were six values that we did with a private healthcare company or private hospital that we work specifically with. Uh, and those were their values. But when you look at those values, you can begin to see how you can translate those into any form of employee engagement. Because when we look at wellness and employee engagement, they are intrinsically linked. The more we engage our employees, the happier and healthier they are. But now we also have to ensure that they're happy and healthy in order for them to be engaged. So this days of wellness had one department and employee engagement had another. To me, they are one and the same. So the wellness of our employees. Whenever you look at well-being, I can never find a consistent spelling. 
Yeah. But, but I found that really interesting because well-being seems to be a new word du jour within our organizations. Uh, I know we've always had versions of it, but now we're beginning to really look at it seriously. And I just found that really interesting. And even when you Google it, even Google says there is no consistent spelling for well-being in, in the corporate world because it is still evolving and developing. And what does it actually mean? You know, one very simple one was the state of being comfortable, happy, and healthy. So well-being isn't just about being fit and going to the gym and eating well and having extra nice food for lunches. There's, it's a much larger world in which we've got to be looking at in terms of mental health, supporting leaders, supporting our employees through stress, depression. Now again, this is not my area of expertise uh, by nature. It simply has become it because I'm an employee engagement and culture specialist. And as that employee engagement and culture world began to develop further and begin to uh, increase on other areas, wellness is now on all of our radars within engage employee engagement and culture. Um, so one of the things that I see all the time is the word mental health. And there's a big stigma around mental health. I feel really uncomfortable with the word. I don't know if it's my age. Every time I see it, I think crazy, <laughs> straight jacket, being pulled away, all of those things. You know, that stigma does exist and it actually exists still in me. Now, I don't believe in any of that, but even still when I see the word, it kind of makes me feel uncomfortable a little bit. Now, I of course have to dialogue and get over that, but I'm being honest. But that's why there is still such a stigma in our organization around mental health. And it still sits in that word mental. It's not about health, you're mental. Anybody feel a little uncomfortable if somebody says mental health? You're all okay? Yeah, being honest. Yeah, there is still a little bit of a stigma for me. Now, I don't believe in the stigma, but there's just something that says, oh, Dale, don't. People will judge you. People will make fun of you. Now, I maybe that comes back to all the way to my early days. I mean, I'm pretty much on most spectrums. <laughs> uh, and I've always kind of looked at mental health as something that you had to hide. Now, I always, when I grew up, I had dyslexia, and I still do. You know, I remember some times when I was growing up, and it was probably about grade three, when I used to have to go to special class. And there's a real stigma to that, because in those days, dys that dyslexia wasn't a topic. You were just stupid. And so it came to that special moment in class after whatever period we were doing and whatever thing that all the kids could be included, the teacher would always say, okay, those that go to Mrs. Cummings, the special class, can you all get up and go? And you used to have to get up and march yourself out. And I think that's maybe where the stigma of mental health came in for me, was that you were segregated, that you were weaker than everybody else. And that's a lot of pressure to put on people. However, what they didn't know is Mrs. Cummings was an amazing teacher. She, and she had a sandbox made glitter and glue, and she taught us how to read in different ways. So she actually was a dyslexia expert before we even used the word. She taught us how to think differently and understand that it wasn't our problem. We just had a different way of seeing the world, having a creative mind. And now I, now I lecture doing some dyslexia talks uh, because it's actually an advantage in my life not a disability, because it isn't a learning difficulty, it's just learning differently. But the stress that that would have put on me and the stigma that would have been attached was mental health, <laughs> bad. So we need to open up this idea of what is mental health. Now this is my dog, Buster. Isn't he cute? <laughs> but the reason I put Buster up here, because it was like those sweaty, uh, sweaty palm conversations that we were talking about this morning. Um, I don't know if anybody knows much about beagles, but they're incredibly smart and mischievous. And we always have this laugh when it, Buster's doing anything wrong and you look at Buster and go, Buster, don't. We call it the Buster look. He'll never look you in the eye when he's doing something wrong. And the second that you challenge him on he's done the wrong thing, he looks, well, or he'll go off and do something else as if it never happened. And it kind of reminded me of those kind of conversations because when we, people seek out support and they need our help, often we do a buster look. Oh yeah, I'll get back to you. 
because we feel uncomfortable with these, with these kind of conversations. Okay, so think about with that as we go forward because asking those people those questions, are you okay? It's kind of like what uh, Mike said this morning, you know, hi, how are you? Say, I'm shit. <laughs> I'm having a real awful day. 90% of the time they go, oh yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, how's it go? Keep, keep it up, keep it up. Yeah, because we don't ask outwardly people and hope that they need our help. We ask people just because it's the right thing to do and we go walking through, whether it be a contact center or wherever, we walk through simply going, hi, 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 how are you, how are you, how are you? Um, do we ever stop to really look at those that might not be okay? So challenge yourself. Next time someone says, are you okay? Say, I'm shit. I'm having a really crappy day. And even see if they notice, and if they do notice, well, do they do anything about it, like stop. Oh yeah, sorry about that, yeah, really sorry to hear that, and keep going. So we, in order to get, create wellness, we kind of begin to look at some of the research that, that we are seeing coming out of, well, out of the UK especially, because the government in the UK has spent a lot of money in supporting wellness over the last couple of years, as to, has corporate. But 66% of people have personally experienced mental health. 61 uh, had mental health of their own. Now, we've got to get rid of this stigma around mental health. Depression, feeling lonely, feeling not supported, feeling overwhelmed, overworked, are all part of our mental health. 56% of leaders or managers that, uh, that were interviewed in this study said they would not hire somebody if they had a previous condition with depression or mental health. 27% of, of employees said that their organization had a more reactive approach than a proactive approach to well-being. And what that means is we wait until something awful happens. And then we all run around trying to recover from something that has dramatically happened due to, to somebody's ill health. What they did say is 92% of people with mental health conditions believe that admitting it in the workplace might be damaging to their job. That's a staggering statistic about employees and leaders being honest about why they would not say something because one, they think they might lose their job, become stigmatized, or be an outcast. We gotta to begin to look at what is this balance that us as leaders have. What is our social responsibility or our corporate responsibility? And how do we manage this brand and culture at all times? Because they are in a balancing act and they are simultaneously in play at all times. Because the brand is what people buy into and the culture is what people live in. I, I always look at a brand or any organization, it has a wireframe that looks like this. It has departments, it has uh, uh, managers and senior managers and other managers, but it, it has to have a certain wireframe in order to stay in business. And a culture should be equal. A culture should have no hierarchy. The business needs a hierarchy to maintain function, but a culture should be we're all in it together, that we're all equal, that we all have a voice. We can't always have our own way, but we should always have a voice. And that is the way cultures have been forming for the last 12 million years. We go back right to tribes and begin to investigate uh, cultures and the way in which we form communities. Communities is a recipe. There's no thing new in organizational culture. And anybody tries to sell you that, they're, 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 they're deluded. We've been organizing communities since the beginning of our species <laughs> in whatever form whether we had leaders and we had workers and we had hunters and we had gatherers and we had all kinds of infrastructure and in the way it needed to be maintained. But at the heart of all that is we had a commonality of belief and support from each other and a belief that the community was stronger together than it was ever gonna be apart. And that goes back 12 million years. So organizational culture is just repeating and recycling all this information because we've gotta get back to what I call the human element because our culture is supported by the organization and it, as being asked to represent the organization, but the balance needs to come backwards on itself and the organization needs to begin to look more inwardly into its community from a human element. What do we all need to, to, to be great at what we do? 
I, I went through a really, a really tr traumatic period with Bridge over the last couple of years. Lots of change, lots of travel, lots of things going on in my life, in my personal life. I actually began to experience some panic attacks in the morning. Now, I'm a really confident person, I think naturally, and I, I love being around people. I got to this point, and I can be honest about it, I got to this point when I woke up in the morning, I just started feeling sick. I started feeling this flutter going on, and I thought, wow, is this a panic attack? I don't know if I was having them or not. I'd never had a panic attack. But I'd wake up, and I just thought, oh my God, this day is just gonna, I just got so much on, I've gotta go over here, and this, and that. And my brain was being pulled in so many different ways, I just was not being at my best. And it's important for us to be able to be honest about that, because what sits in every great community and every great culture should be the support and honesty in, of each other because we're all going through something. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to see what tra traumatic transformation feels like. Uh, and I went on the Whole30 diet. Has anybody ever done the Whole30? For 30 days, you cut out wheat, dairy, sugar, legumes, and in sugar means alcohol. <laughs> Just saying, there's sugar and alcohol. <laughs> you know, and then you track the roller coaster in which you go through. What's that? Yeah, it's a hard one. It's a hard one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no wheats, no grains, no, that means with sugar, that means you can't have any condiments, no breads, just only healthy food, and, uh, and, no, and again, nothing with any sauces or sugar. Um, but you feel great after a certain period. But you go through a very, very uh, heavy period of struggle when, you, when your body is detoxing. Um, but the more recent one that I've been work I worked on was uh, what I wanted to understand was this mind, body, and spirit and doing a 50-day challenge where I would focus on my all three elements. So I'll, in that, uh, I worked with a personal coach who worked with me on my mind and my attitude and being present uh, and, and delved into some kind of dark closets that I didn't really want to go into but needed, needed entry. Uh, uncomfortable. Body, I had a personal trainer and he worked with me uh, and we had a very strict re regime, which clearly I didn't stick to. <laughs> and spirit, and we really wanted to understand what is the spirit? Um, and because it's a very interesting thing to try to understand why that is so important to our wellness, but it's really all about purpose, having reason to do what we do. And sometimes we really need to reconnect to our purpose because we get on this hamster wheel we get in, we do it, we get out, we do it, we get in, we do it, we get out, we try again. And we sometimes forget uh, that ultimate purpose of why do you do what you do? And if you're just doing it to get paid, get another job. Because I don't believe that very many people just in our world just do it to get paid unless they have to. But often we need to reconnect with why do we do what we do? Because that is the biggest part of wellness for ourselves. Um, and it's really interesting because when I first started it, I sat down with my team and I had all these extra experts around. I had a nutritionist looking at my diet and I thought I was just going to get better and better for 50 days. I had this utopia I was walking into. It was like a cloud and I was going to come out with a six pack and I was going to be 20 years younger and an Adonis. It didn't work. What I found was the real life that I was living. And I struggled to do it. I struggled to get to the gym because of my, my scheduling. Uh, I, and the, the motive of the mind stuff opened up all kinds of cans of worms that I didn't want to enter. Uh, and I actually struggled and I didn't get better. In fact, I kind of got worse for a while, kind of got better, and then it kind of fizzled out. And then it was day 50 and I just felt the same. But when I track the journey every single day, I realize actually how hard it is to look at our own wellness. You know, we have this view of, oh, I could just go to the gym and I, oh, if I eat yogurt today, I'm gonna to be thin. Uh, and if I go to the gym once, I'm gonna have a muscle. No, it's a continuous cycle that we're all on and all of our employees are on it and all of us are on it. So I'm gonna get you to kind of ask a couple of questions at your table as, as just, People, we've got to remember that we're, we are not just employees and not just leaders. At the end of the day, we are all human beings at the end. And we all have what I call the human element. So we all have our desires that relate to us no matter where we go. And you could go to any job, any country, any place, and these will still be with you. But what do you value in relationships that you think give you good health? Anybody? 
Time? Yeah, we want time with people so we get to know them and they really experience who they are. Anybody else? Respect. respect. Yeah, respect is a huge one. And what is respect? You know, we're often taught with respect that if I give respect, I get respect. No. You give respect because that's who you are and you hope that you get it back. Uh, I just did a, a workshop last week actually on respect and we identified there's three areas of respect in bi and I think in business as well. But we have, uh, we have, I respect you for who you are. So I respect people who work hard for a living. You know, I grew up with a single mom who raised two kids. It's ingrained in me to respect people who do the best they can with what they got. Um, and, then I, and then we have respect that is mutual. A relationship is forged and we have mutual respect. And then we have duty of respect. But we would hope that with respect, we give respect because we can control it. Great. What was another one that was over here? Acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. You want acceptance in relationships. These are all big words that we want within all the relationships. And you carry those with you to work every single day. <laughs> because you carry them with who you are as an individual, what you value most in life. And therefore they should forge the relationships of all people around you. And you don't always get them when you're put into a work environment, simply because it's an uncontrolled environment. However, we need to work really hard to ensure that they are created there. What about leaders? So as a leader within your role, what do you want? Results. results. What does results mean for you? Achieving the goal set? Is sometimes the bar too high? Sometimes, yeah. Recognition, yeah, so as a leader, you want recognition. You know, we talk about employee recognition and how we have to recognize our employees. You know, I often, you know, we look at leadership and I was, and I was watching something from Simon Sinek just yesterday uh, around, you know, leaders are like parents. And I've said that for years and years, but now I'm beginning to think slightly differently. We are, but also, when does a leader get recognition? You know, I, I, again, I, I never do a presentation without mentioning my mom because she's an amazing lady, 80 years old and is still going strong. Um, but I look back at our childhood. She raised two kids on her own and at a time when she did, we were poor. We didn't have a lot. Um, and I, you know, I, I look back at some of the stories of what she achieved in order to give us our first bikes, in order for us to never know we were poor. We were never allowed to talk about money. And then I look back now as an adult and looking through the lens of this actual presentation, I thought, who ever gave her the recognition? When did she ever achieve? Personally, she did what for her own, for herself, but there was never any fanfare for her, no matter how hard she worked, because she did it for us. And if I was to replay that, now I give to her because I love her, but I give to her because it's time I can give back. But as a leader, sometimes we don't get that recognition because we're told that we have to support our people at all costs, even if it's your own ill health. Okay, any other ones? Ownership. Ownership, what does that mean to you? Feeling invested. Yeah, so as a leader, you need to feel invested in. Yeah. Yeah, good, yeah, and why shouldn't you? Yeah, we should be invested in, because uh, it's one of the main components of our own engagement. We want autonomy, which is freedom. We want mastery, which is getting better at stuff. And we want purpose, which is being part of something bigger than ourselves. So when we did some research around this and asked several leaders these questions, the answers just kept coming back the same for each one. What we really, what each one of them, or not each one, but statistically, the four strongest areas that leaders said they needed, both in life and in work, was trust, amongst themselves, amongst their community, either personal or business, and that the business side also built in the company. I need to, to have trust with the businesses I work with. Compassion, you know, that's that human element that we all desire. We have a desire for, for compassion. It's not all about the numbers and it's not all about just results. It's about actually working in an environment that we feel safe. We feel that people actually care. Stability was another one of the top four answers. And what stability is all about. Stability is all about knowing where, well, you know where the ship is going. That you know that it's not gonna be a rocky transformation or change. People want some level of stability. We all go through periods of change. You know, and if you've ever gone you know, backpacking, 
<laughs> I, always, I, I love backpacking. Love it. But I also love to get home <laughs> after a good hard trip. If you, know, if you spend three weeks in Cambodia on an, on an island, when you get home, you're first into the shower going, whoa. So we want stability. Even though we like challenge, we also need it balanced with stability and hope. I found that the most interesting one from the dialogue that we were having with leaders was that they all had some degree, and I think everyone, if they didn't use the word hope, they used versions of hope, that there was something beyond where they currently were. Well, and it wasn't just a promotion, it was that they were given, with the work they were doing now had this higher sense of purpose, that it was going towards something, and I think that is all about having better internal communication because all people want to have some level of hope. And that, that's what gives us guidance during the bad times. So we broke it down into f or five key areas. Now I won't de delve too deep into all of these, but some of them speak primarily for themselves. But health, again, is what it says. So when we look at workplace well-being, yeah, it's very important to have healthy uh, options available for people, getting people to stand up, move around, exercise, all of that stuff I'm a firm believer in. Especially in a context where you're sitting down and it's so unhealthy for your body. We're not designed to be sat so long. Um, but also offering better healthy options. I sometimes go to staff canteens and organizations. I think, oh my God, you might as well just pour lard down my throat. <laughs> you know, there's no healthy options anywhere. But, but allowing people to have healthy options, but educate people on healthy options. Uh, there was a really interesting study that I saw. It was done by a big consultancy, and they, um, they, had, they, were, they had two groups of negotiations going on. And then, so they had a couple of hours of negotiation, and in one group, they served them all those white doorstop sandwiches for lunch, all those heavy carbs that you have when you have a business lunch, and the other one, they served healthy options and then watch the difference in the negotiating style after lunch. The healthy option people smashed them because these people were all heavy in carb comas. So it's important to give people nutritional advice as well because I believe it's our social responsibility as, as, as an organization to educate our people. Now, I'm not saying we have to force carrot sticks down people's throats, if that's, but we can at least offer the education of what the importance of good diet is, especially if you want higher productivity, because productivity is linked to diet. That's scientific. Security, it's, what we mean by security is basically people allowing to be themselves. When people feel most safe is when they are authentic. But we throw this word authenticity around so much. It became a word du jour. Um, but what is it to be authentic? Well, that's where you get safety and security from. When you feel that you can be yourself in the organization. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we're going to uh, go wild and people are going to be, oh, well, to be me, I need to stand on my head every three minutes. It's not being crazy like that. But it is actually about being feeling safe and comfortable in your community. And that stems right back to honesty. Because we've got to remember that every organization, any call center, any business is a community. And it forms like any other community, whether it be a religious group, a book club, a swimming club, a country. It is a formation of people with, collect with, with a collection of people with ideologies that should support each other. And sometimes you'll get people that show up in the community that don't fit. Have you ever had an employee that just didn't fit? maybe the ecosystem of the culture. It didn't make them a bad person. It just meant that they weren't quite right for the way the community works. Environment, again, I'm not gonna get into environment, but we, there's so much information that stats around the physical environment that creates wellness. You know, color, rain, smells, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, we just put a, a video on our YouTube channel with it's called, a chap called DDF, he's the brain science person for Ogilvy, uh, and they just redone their office in London, all in a style that increases wellness from an environmental point of view. It's really interesting. They even have a, a moss wall, a wall of moss in, in there, which because it's proven that when we are close to nature, we have higher degrees of productivity and higher degrees of wellness. So environment is very important. Lighting is very important. Air is very important. 
Uh, relationships, and that's the one I primarily like to focus on, is the relationships we have with people, whether it be leaders or employees, but do you feel safe in your community, especially if you need support? And purpose is a, is a massive one for all employee engagement because it directly links to why do we do what we do, and it all has to be part of something bigger than ourselves, especially at a call center. If your sole purpose is to answer only the next call, Yeah, yeah you're, you are a, a representative of the brand every single phone call. Your higher purpose is to engage people so that they love your organization and they see it the way you see it. There's a higher degree of purpose, but if you have no purpose, what's the point? So when I look at that achievement stuff, you know, I see all of this kind of pressure cooker happening with leaders be more, achieve more, get more, give more. But then you also, on the other side, is you gotta be open to change. No, uh, we're changing. Whose organization is or has changed in the last few years? Oh yeah, we're all changing. <laughs> we call it transformation now because it's less of a scary word. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I use change and oh no, I don't like that. Transformation is progressive. Do you ever feel like you just don't wanna support? We have a, yeah. we have a, we have a, we have a, a, a reminder that we, we do in Bridge. Like sometimes when something bad happens, you know it's gonna affect your mood. We look at each other and go, do you hate everybody right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that just helps to remind us that we don't, but it is just a really funny expression to trigger the brain. So think about it, we don't hate everybody, but we've gotta be all that. And then we've gotta be ourselves. And then we have that other lie they told us. We have to be happy. Are you happy all the time? Oh my God, well, you, where, you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're most of the time. Yeah, but we, you know, we've been sold this lie in wellness that we have to be happy all the time. It's not human to be happy all the time. We have emotion. We, are, we, we want to be happy all the time, but if you are striving for pure happiness all the time, that's a pressure cooker I don't want to get into. I'm not saying we should be unhappy, but sometimes in the strive to be happy, we become unhappy because I can't achieve it, so now I'm depressed. Facebook, what a lie that is. Every single one of my friends, and even people on my Facebook that I don't even know, are always on holiday drinking champagne or getting married or having babies. Anybody else have a Facebook family like that? You know, I just want somebody to put on Facebook, I'm out on a shit day. <laughs> and I hate everybody. <laughs> yeah. But we're being programmed to believe that we have to be happy all the time and that creates unwellness. I'm not saying that we should be unhappy, but in, this, in the pursuit of happiness, we find pressure. Because, it's, because we're human beings, we have bad days. So I thought I would put a little video together for you. Well, I, I, I thought of it, but I will give credit to the actors, the, the people we work around, and, uh, and my team for putting this together in record time. But I began to think about, we all have backstories, and they're not always happy. So every day when people are coming to the organization, we have to recognize that in the pursuit of happiness, we have reality. And in reality, we all have a backstory. And we've got to begin to recognize this backstory with our people. I have a sick child. I'm struggling with this workload. I am unclear what my job is. I miss my family. I cannot work these new hours. I am scared I will lose my job. I do not feel supported. I am getting a divorce. I am being bullied. I do not fit in.
when we show up at work, we all have things going on. And I think the most important part of an organization is the way it supports its community, not only in the achievements, but also in the times that makes it human. And I think that's not only the job of a leader to give their employees, but also leaders need it themselves. You know, when I look at my own backstory, I, I spent so much time feeling like a fraud. You know, growing up with dyslexia and being told I was stupid and, and all kinds of various things that happened in my life. I remember starting a corporate world and doing very well. But I, for so long, I lied when I was in, in work that I had this and that going on. I was great. But I, I often showed up at work because I progressed very quickly into management and feeling like I don't belong here. And every day I was showing up and getting more and more under stress because I never, I felt like a fraud. And then one day I was working, doing a presentation. I thought, I'm tired of bullshitting. This is who I am. And it was almost like stripping bare in front of the audience and saying a little bit about my real story, about abuse, about dyslexia, and about all this other stuff that I tried to keep hidden. That was actually causing stress as a leader because I was never being authentic. I could turn it on and off like that because I'm a performer. And I don't think we need to divulge all of that to people, but we need to get to a stage of authenticity where we're comfortable with ourselves if we're going to truly be parents to other people. And I think that's one thing that my mother definitely taught me. She was always herself. Worked hard and taught us good values, but she is who she is. So think about that for yourself as leaders that it's not about having to divulge that to all of our staff and run around telling every kind of horror story, but we need to actually find support with our own community about the things we are struggling with and the support we need. Because driving this employee engagement from the top, generally our stakeholders are the leaders. And what I began to look at and identify with this leadership population is around resilience. When leaders start to demonstrate areas of non-resilience and non-wellness, even though they're not going to tell anybody, they start to manifest signs that they are struggling. And the three signs that I've identified is health. They generally start to become less healthy because they're, they're, they're always on that stress diet. Coffee, carbs, eating at desks, on the go, running around, always busy never taking an opportunity to consider what their own health is. Late nights, not sleeping well. Does anybody suffer from a little bit of insomnia when it's not going right? Yeah. My sleep pattern goes crazy when I'm stressed. And then that just compounds on my next day because I'm really irritable. And then that makes me feel bad because I don't like to be mean to people. And then I lay in bed, oh, I wish I hadn't have said that to so-and-so and now I'm stressing out about that. And now I can't sleep again and the cycle continues. Can you identify with that, show of hand? Yeah, because we want to do the best. My heart's in the right place, but my sleep deprivation is also not helping in, in my pursuit to do well for others. Risk-taking is the other one. They're always in a meeting and never make decisions. Because as long as we're always busy and we're always in a meeting, we don't have to take risks. It's always in development. The number one thing that we hear from employees about leaders is they never make any decisions. They just talk about it and they're always in meetings. And I began to see that more and more in when, when, when resilience and wellness begins to drop. If the leader is not getting the support they need, they hide in meetings. And their ability to take risks and challenges and innovation drops dramatically. And, that, that, and that's never inherent in a good leader. They don't want that, but that's where they just feel safe. And relationships. Like I said, they begin to, to disconnect from their team, remove themselves from the shop floor, and they begin to create behavior patterns that causes disrespect and lack of trust with their teams. So if you've ever experienced any of these, it's often just because our resilience is dropping and we're not coping as well as we should. Because each of these are telltale signs of when somebody's not coping. And if you see it in others, then maybe give your hand of assistance to see that they're okay. Because I see it all the time, and generally I can begin to see it in some of our clients because the, the culture is unwell and it's being driven by leaders that are not as resilient as they should be. 
I want us to recognize that in order to rebalance the best version of ourselves, we have to be open, honest, be trustworthy, not only to ourselves and others, but those relationships that we have with others and our team, but also our peers. And I think sometimes with leadership, it's about having better peer support. Your team doesn't need to know that, but yet they will feel the difference between you being well and unwell. And what we mean by unwell is to, it's not just depression, it's, it's stress. Stress causes us to behave and manifest different behavior patterns. It's, it's about even depression. It's about uh, not sleeping well, not being at my best, creating behavior patterns that cause relationships to break down. But get better at stuff. I think that's what we spoke about there. It's very much about, you know, leaders need to constantly be educating and achieving new, new heights. And it may not be because you're going to get a, a, the next roll up, but educate yourself in what great leadership is and behavior science and the psychology of leadership. Because it's fascinating being a leader, as it is a parent. It, there is an amazing opportunity when you're a leader is to become better at leadership simply by the education and support you can find out there. Have your voice heard. Be a, be a leader of change and be the voice for people. And I think it's in that strength that we actually become uh, more well within our community because uh, it's that courage and that energy that comes with courage when your voice is heard um, and have a higher purpose. You know, we all need to recognize sometimes realignment. Of why do we do what we do? And I think that in that importance, it's about creating a corporate culture that supports wellness, not a reactive one and wait till something happens. Go back to our organizations and talk to our people of what, what support do they need? Because this is the, the intrinsic link that we talk about with employee engagement. You know, employee engagement is moving forward and fast now because we're recognizing the human element. It's not just about making happy clappy clubs where everybody comes in happy. It's about also creating a supportive community where people feel safe and committed to. And I think that also is, a, is just as equal within any form of engagement. You know, one last picture buster, my yoga dog. But we're starting to see companies change. Does anybody here have an office dog? Yeah, great. You got an office dog? Yeah. Yeah, we're for PetSmart, so we oh. have dogs everywhere. <laughs> oh. Oh my God, I, I was saying to my friend, if I was to work for any company, I want to work for PetSmart. <laughs> but there is a lot of incredible research that comes around dogs. Now it, comes, now, it doesn't come with all bubbles and it's all great. It also comes with challenges. You know, Buster is great at engaging and gives people extra exercise because he can always walk. Uh, he likes to snore and he likes to hang out with people, but he also decreases productivity. I'll be honest, I think because everybody's like working away and Buster comes over, me, me, I'm here, and then everybody keeps stop working. So I think it comes with a lot of positive stuff, but it has to be in the right environment that there will be a productivity shift to some degree, but I think it's regained by the health and the happiness it brings. So I only bring that is that we have to begin to look at creative and innovative ways that suit our culture what works for our people. And there is a lot of great new research around the benefits of having pets or that environmental stuff in terms of difference of air, difference of sound, smells, and especially some really progressive contact centers that are really working towards the environment of wellness. And that can be part of your leadership challenge is to go out and seek out great examples. And they don't all have to be costly, but it's about humans supporting humans. Okay, so just so I'm finished, so be innovative in your approach, you know, because it, we need to really look at support both on an individual basis for ourselves and our people, because we all have a backstory, but then it's about how do we support the collective as well. Uh, always remember it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And I think in a great community and a, and a supportive community, that's where we need to create opportunities for people to have focus groups and dialogues with each other on the things that are challenging them and working in a customer service environment where you're being bombarded by negativity one after another, think of what that does to the human psyche. So somebody asked me the other day about venting. Is it okay for agents to go off and vent? I disagree with that because all you're doing is perpetuating more negative cycle of thought. Uh, don't ask somebody, just go off and vent, you know, go kick the wall, whatever. It'll go away. No, it doesn't go away. It's about how do we have dialogue with people when they've had a really bad call? 
venting is never going to be the medicine that supports wellness. It just doesn't work. It's proven from a psychological and neuroscience point of view. It's a self-perpetuating cycle. We need to talk it through. Why is it upset you? Why is it bothering you? What could you have done differently? And all of those questions that help reprogram the brain to recognize how to do it better and different in the future. And be humble. Be more human as a leader. You know, and also have more faith in our peers to be there for us. You know, that the people around us and other leaders probably have all got it. They've all had it. <laughs> And maybe it's just an opportunity for us to forge better and more progressive relationships with people based on support. Okay, that's me done. So thank you very much.